All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that amazing introduction. Hope everyone is feeling nice and caffeinated awake for this 9 a.m. talk. Um, so I'm Emily Schechter. I am a product manager on the Chrome browser security team. And today I'm gonna talk about the trouble with URLs, which I think is a really important usability, usable security problem. So let's start with a thought exercise. Imagine that you're living in a small town in India or Indonesia, and like most other people in your town, you're coming online for the first time on a mobile device. So this might be your first experience with computers, right? It doesn't involve an introductory computing class, doesn't involve document, ed document editing, doesn't involve a desktop computer. It involves a grid of logos and brand names. And you start to get comfortable with this grid of apps, right? It's pretty easy to understand. There's Facebook, there's Google. Now let's say you start browsing the web and you start navigating around to some websites. And on the web, we're representing identity with URLs. So do you think that as a user in a town in India, you would be able to understand just from the URL who's publishing these sites? Do you think that you would even look at the URL or would you just depend on the website content itself to give you a sense for who owns the site? And let's say maybe you're a model security conscious user of the web, just like everyone in this room, right? And so you do look at URLs all the time to make sure that you're on the site you think you're on. But now there are new top level domains coming out, right? So can you tell which one of these is the real Google blog site? And can you tell which one of these is the authoritative site for Google experiments? But URLs are great for many reasons too, which is why we heavily depend on them on the web. They're really great for sending links to really specific things, right? Here we get a hint that this is gonna be a product from Amazon. Um, and you can copy and paste them easily to share with friends, right? And of course, in security land, URLs are our last line of defense against spoofing attacks if all else fails. So we've started to call this problem the URL elephant in the room. URLs are not working well, but we heavily depend on them for all sorts of use cases, and we show them a lot in our most visible UIs in many applications. So in the Chrome team, we've started to discuss what URLs are used for and which of these use cases they actually succeed at, and we've started to brainstorm alternatives that might better solve some of these requirements. And keep in mind here that we're not actually talking about changing things that are happening under the hood of Chrome or web browsers. We're not like talking about dismantling the empire of DNS or anything like this. We're really just talking about how these things appear in our UI. So in this talk, I'll go through four functions of URLs, functions that they're supposed to have, and then for each of these, I'll talk about how well URLs are actually achieving those goals, and then I'll give you some ideas for what might better solve some of those requirements. So here's a breakdown of URLs. Starting from the left, we have the scheme, then the host, then the path, and the whole thing is the URL. So the scheme is supposed to represent connection security, right? So here it says HTTPS, so we know the connection is secure. Great. And the next piece is the host, which is supposed to tell us about site identity. So in this case, we know we're talking to the New York Times, and that's pretty straightforward. Cool. And finally, we have the path, which might tell us some useful information about the structure of the website as well as the content of the page. So here, for example, we know this is gonna be an extremely intriguing article about the looming digital meltdown, right? We know the article was published in early January of this year, um, and maybe we know that the New York Times website also is actually organized according to date and then according to section, so this is great. And the whole URL itself is supposed to be useful for sharing content, right? So I can just copy and paste it to my friends to send them this cool article. I can just send my friends some nice TV download that I found of Game of Thrones, whatever. Um, and it's supposed to be great for navigating too, right? So if I hear maybe geico.com on the radio, I can just input the URL and get there. 
but are URLs actually achieving any of these goals? Let's take a look. So first, let's start with the scheme. So for many years, we've suspected that just showing the string HTTPS is not enough to communicate that a site is secure. So we've shown this lock icon in some form over the years next to HTTPS sites. And then a few years ago, we did some research on the Chrome team, which showed that the icon itself really wasn't working, right? We saw the example, um, the icon, sometimes people think it's like a green purse. So now we show these human readable strings that help additionally communicate connection security. Um, so we added the secure string and it's translated into other languages when Chrome uh, is used in other languages. So this is great. And now since this communicates the security of the site, we're currently working on hiding the HTTPS scheme so that we're not showing syntax that isn't actually useful to users, right? So this is gonna um, roll out in an upcoming version of Chrome. And we're doing the same thing for non-secure HTTP. So the top image here shows what our icon for all HTTP sites used to look like. And this was a problem because the scheme HTTP doesn't communicate at all the lack of security in non-secure sites, right? So we added the non-secure string in certain circumstances. And the change required a slow rollout over many years because we thought that introducing this string right away actually could cause harm. Because when users see warnings too many times, they get what's called warning fatigue, so they stop paying attention to warnings, right? And we didn't want to induce warning fatigue. And also, we just generally didn't want the internet to seem like a scary place. Um, we don't want people to be afraid of using the web. We don't want them to stop using the web. But the good news is that now enough sites are HTTPS, so we've finally gotten to a place where we're going to mark all HTTP sites as not secure. And this is coming out in version 68 of Chrome, which is rolling out um, this July in just a few months. So we consider this a success story, right? We took non-readable information in URLs, and we did something else to make it usable and informative. The scheme was supposed to be telling people about connection security, and it wasn't, so we replaced it with more understandable UI that did solve that requirement, and then we removed the non-readable UI. Okay, great. So now let's move on to the end, to the path, which in this case is pretty useful, right? Like I said, it tells us about the content of the page, it tells us about the structure of the site. But unfortunately, many URL paths are really not useful at all. For example, Google Docs URLs, right? And some may argue that this is actually a problem for security reasons, because non-readable syntax might make people ignore other more critical pieces of the URL. And I'll actually talk later in this talk about um, some research where we tested this hypothesis. But regardless of this possible security issue, I think that this is a problem for just usability and simplicity reasons, right? We should strive to only show information that's actually informative to humans. So some pieces of the paths actually are useful to some people, right? Like the New York Times example, those paths that show useful information about the structure of the site, content of the page, but I think there actually could be more usable ways to show this information when it is useful. For example, if you can see here, this is actually showing uh, the google.com search results page. And what they're doing here in green is they're breaking down the path with arrows to actually help people understand the structure of the site. But unfortunately, the reality is that most developers just aren't making paths that are that useful. And right now, the browser doesn't have a great way to parse and show a useful path versus a non-useful one. But the fact that browsers need to accommodate both of these scenarios, useful and non-useful paths, actually is a key reason why this is a pretty complex problem. Okay, so we've talked about the problems with the scheme and with the path. So now let's zoom out a little bit and look at the whole URL itself which is supposed to be useful for sharing and for navigating. And the fact that the URL is supposed to be useful for navigating is actually a key reason why this problem is so hard. Because the, the URL display service, in Chrome we're calling this the Omnibox, needs to be both read and write, right? People need to be able to read URLs and they also need to be able to type into it, and that's complex. So to explain what I mean, let's take a look at 
some of those right aspects to see why writing URLs is so problematic. So unfortunately, typos often send you nowhere or to the wrong place entirely, right? And if you were coming online for the first time, if you didn't really understand um, the internet, you might not understand why this is happening. And does anyone have the patience to type in whole URLs by hand? So I remember um, back in 2016, I was listening to Hillary Clinton give a talk. And I remember at one point she turns to the camera and goes, to learn more, go to www.hillaryclinton.com forward slash issues forward slash disability dash rights. Right? And this is ridiculous. Like, there's no way I'm remembering this whole thing, and what if I don't know how to spend, spell Hillary or disability? And this gets even worse. There are numbers in the URL, right? Let's say I hear a radio ad for 1-800-contacts.com. How am I supposed to know if any of the numbers are actually spelled out with words? How am I supposed to know if there's a dash in between 1 and 800, right? So URLs are actually a really bad way for navigating for that reason. And typing in new URLs on mobile keyboards especially is really hard, right? And this gets worse in new situations that we need to um, accommodate for, like VR, where text entry is even more awkward, right? Like, I'm never going to be able to enter www.hillaryclinton.com forward slash issues forward slash disability dash rights on this thing. And copying and pasting URLs on mobile often requires tricky highlighting and scrolling or less discoverable patterns. Okay, so there might be a better way to share content, right? There's been an explosion of these share buttons in apps, which I think is actually a much more usable way to share content than copying and pasting URLs. And so something that's cool here is that the URL is still the underlying transport of information, right? It's just not being exposed to the user in raw form. So you might think of this in the same way that users see rendered markup, right? Even when it's HTML underneath. Here, it's still the URL underneath, but it's a much more intuitive UI flow on top. Okay, so we've talked about the scheme, we've talked about the path, and we've talked about the whole URL. So now let's move on to the host, right? Which is supposed to tell us about site identity. So here in this example, we're talking to the New York Times, uh, maybe we've just trained ourselves to ignore that www subdomain, and all is well, right? But unfortunately, there actually turn out to be a lot of circumstances where this really does not work so well. So here are five of them. I'll go through these five problems. So let's start with confusing syntax. So let's say you're, you're reading this URL from left to right as most people do if you're reading the English language, right? So you might not actually know if this is coming from google.com or not, right? It might be pretty hard to tell. So about a year ago, um, we hypothesized on the Chrome team that visually emphasizing important pieces of the URL and visually de-emphasizing less important pieces of the URL might actually help users read URLs and therefore identify suspicious pages based on the U their URL. So, these were some of, the, um, some of the UI treatments that we wanted to test, right? The first thing up here is how we display URLs today. Um, the second one has kind of these left-hand subdomains grayed out. So we were hypothesizing if it would actually help if we grayed out subdomains like in the second picture. Um, the third picture there, we've removed the entire path and we just tested dot, dot, dot. So we were hypothesizing that it might help if we removed extraneous information. Um, the fourth picture there is not showing up well on the projector, but uh, the, the subdomains and the path are sort of super dim. They're, they're very visually de-emphasized. Um, and finally, you know, we, we hypothesized that it might help if we bolded just this uh, top-level domain plus one. We call this the effective top-level domain plus one, uh, which is just the most important information when you're communicating site identity. And so we did research where we showed users this screenshot uh, with those five different URLs at the top, and then we asked them some questions about how comfortable they would feel logging into the page. And unfortunately, we found no significant differences across any of the options, right? Across every option, over half of the respondents didn't even notice the fishy URL at all. And those who did notice the URL tended to say that they trusted it because it was Google. So 
Unfortunately, we really haven't yet figured out a way to make these multiple subdomains tricky URLs less tricky. And even if we did, about half of people wouldn't notice anyway. All right, let's talk about another problem, which is brand matching. Um, so when registering a domain, site owners don't necessarily know that we're expecting it to be used for site identity, right? So they might not register a domain that actually matches the brand of the site. Um, this is a perfectly okay thing to do, right? Here in the case of uh, the Wall Street Journal, they're serving it from DowJones.com, um, but it's not a great way to match sort of site identity. And what if you don't speak English, right? The situation becomes even worse because Domain name pieces like maps and translate might not actually mean anything to you. And going back to our example from the beginning of the talk, right, for those of you that are still wondering, the real Google blog is actually at blog.google. And we also are serving some smaller domains, some smaller blogs on the google.blog domain, like the security blog is on security.googleblog.com. And also, uh, experiments.withgoogle.com is actually the real site for Google's experiments, so now you know. But you'll probably not remember. <laughs> but the point here is that with these new top-level domains, it becomes impossible for us to expect even expert users to be able to tell site identities just from URLs. And finally, internationalized domain names. So, um, Internationalized domain names, uh, we call these IDNs for short, and they're actually really awesome because they allow us to create URLs in other languages, which makes the web much more friendly to people who don't speak English, right? And it makes the web great for people all over the world. But it then opens up this whole can of worms uh, for site identity reasons. Um, it's really opening the door for domain spoofs because it can make a spoof site appear indistinguishable from another site that's being spoofed. So, um, most web browsers have a set of rules to defend against IDN spoofs where we show what's called puny code um, in the case where we think that there's an IDN spoof happening. Uh, puny code looks like this, right? And uh, I was thinking about this, and you know, I would actually consider this a pretty weak defensive move, right? It's kind of like this, right? Instead of showing a URL that is kind of misleading to some people, we're showing this string that is literally meaningless to everyone. <laughs> Right, and a large number of people aren't going to look at the URL anyway or understand that what we're trying to convey here is this is a defense against a domain spoof. So I definitely consider this an area for improvement. But my larger point here is that showing host names is not a good way to convey site identity. Okay, so if you're kind of depressed by that long list of problems, now let's talk about some solutions. So some of you are probably saying to yourself, Emily, we've seen some of your other talks and we know that you know lots about HTTPS. Let me tell you about this thing which can map the domain to the identity of the site, right? It solves your problem. So <laughs> EV indeed maps domains to legal identities, but the issue is that legal identities are not the same as brand names. Here, mint.com, right, it's owned by Intuit, um, so it's, it, they're, they're not the same thing, right? And you also probably saw this fun site set up by Ian Carroll, right? It was going around the internet in December 2017, and it maps to the Stripe Inc. that was incorporated in Kentucky, but unfortunately, the Stripe Inc. that you know about was incorporated in Delaware, which makes these two Stripe Inc.s totally separate legal identities, right? And all of this ultimately depends on the user looking at the URL bar and noticing the lack of a warning, which they are not going to do. So the conclusion here is that EV is not and can never be a silver bullet anti-spoofing or anti-phishing tool, right? We, as the browser makers, we could decide to change this UI, right? We could decide to show warnings whenever a site wasn't using validated EV, but these examples show that even if we did do this, EV wouldn't be a good defense against phishing attacks because it can be overcome by some moderately motivated attacker. So HTTPS solves network-based attacks, right? It allows us to be confident that an attacker in the middle cannot view or modify traffic. It allows us to verify that the site in question is really that host. 
but it does not allow us to validate that the host in question has anything to do with a brand or product associated with that host. So we need to get these two concepts separated in our minds, and we need to stop mixing them up. So as we make HTTPS cheaper and more automated, more phishing sites will be HTTPS. And I'm here to say that that's okay and that's expected. The reason that's okay is because phishing and man-in-the-middle attacks are two separate problems that we need to solve separately. And any solution that depends on humans making a judgment call about URLs will ultimately not work to solve either of them. But for those of you that are wondering specifically about the Chrome UI that says secure and arguing that it makes phishing more effective, you might be happy to learn that we do want to get rid of this UI, but it's ultimately for kind of a different reason. We wanna to get to a place where we're only warning users when there's a problem, like on an HTTP site or on a phishing site, and we wanna to get to a place where we never have to show positive UI for an HTTPS site because it's just the expected default. And so this will look like this second image here, Right, you'll notice there's no lock icon, there's no secure string, there's no HTTPS, it's just google.com and the default expectation is that it's secure. So ultimately, URLs do not do a good job at solving phishing. And therefore, technology that's dependent on users making judgment about URLs are unable to solve phishing. So we need to lean into systems that actually are designed to usably solve phishing. So with systems like U2F and security keys and password managers, the code is making the decision, not the human, and that's what makes these better defenses. So when you think about it, password managers actually can become a phishing solution if we improve their usability and precision and adoption to the point where manually inputting a password becomes such a foreign concept that we can start warning people when the password manager doesn't trigger. And with systems like uh, Google's safe browsing anti-phishing infrastructure, uh, we use Chrome. So <laughs> Google safe browsing is a system that's built to look for phishing and malware and social engineering so that clients can show warnings on these sites. And for those who aren't familiar with safe browsing, um, the list and the APIs, they're free and publicly available. And they also flag you know, not just phishing but also social engineering so that apps and sites can provide actionable warnings that users will respond to. Um, and then these, these warnings, these full page interstitials do measurably stop people from getting to badness. But even if we solve phishing and even if we solve social engineering, there's still this class of websites that URLs currently are our best protection for. Um, and these are sites that I'm calling non-canonical information sites. So here's two examples. These two sites are not phishing. They're not spoofing, they're not social engineering, so we're not going to show a safe browsing warning, but technical users might be able to tell that they're not the canonical information about Gmail signups, right? And non-technical users who don't understand URLs or maybe are, are coming online for the first time, they might not actually be able to glean this information. So instead, we need to try to convey any signal that we as technical security people are getting from the URL in an understandable way. Um, and I admit that I don't know how we should try to do this yet, um, but you know, we've started to brainstorm heuristics to detect this, as well as some potential UIs that we might show, um, but it's early days and it's a challenging problem. So in this talk, I went through the different pieces of the URL and I talked about what use cases each piece of the URL has and how contrary to what you might believe, URLs really are not doing well at solving these use cases. And I talked about some solutions that might solve these use cases a little bit better. So it's our duty as usable security problem solvers to deal with the URL elephant in the room. Instead of trying to emphasize user education to examine the URL as a security measure, and instead of continuing to build systems like EV that rely on humans understanding URLs, we need to focus on creating systems that are more usable and less brittle. And if we keep doing research and experiments and stay focused on usability for the average internet user, I think that we can come up with some ways to solve each use case of URLs even better. So if you have any questions or ideas, I'd be really excited to talk to you. Um, and I can take questions now.
Thank you. Yeah, I think I, so the question is, how have linked link shorteners helped or harmed URLs in this space? Um, I think that link, shorters, link shorteners are just sort of continuing to exacerbate the problem of, um, you know, URLs becoming even more, uh, even less understandable and like less useful for anti-phishing mechanism. Um, again, as I mentioned, like the reality is that people um, don't understand phishing. They don't understand that the URL is supposed to be a phishing mechanism and they're not gonna look at it anyway. So um, I think it's just sort of continuing to make the problem worse, but. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the question was, have you looked at what Safari does? So Safari does two things off the top of my head that I think are particularly interesting. One is I believe um, they kind of hide the path all the time. They also show the, the EV cert, if it's there, as kind of the main domain name without showing the rest of the URL. Um, but one thing that Safari um, does not do is they don't allow editing of the URL from the first interaction. It's kind of this non-editable label. Um, and in Chrome, um, as I mentioned, one of the important things about the, the Chrome Omnibox is that it's both read and write, like you can type directly into the URL. Um, and so I think we, we would have to kind of change our model entirely if we wanted to, to move toward the Safari model. Um, and we, we sort of care deeply about the ability for people to, to write right from their um, URL bar. But I do commend Safari on their, um, how they've moved to, toward this model of simplicity. Um, I'm not sure I agree with their perspective on EV being you know, the main thing in the URL bar, but yeah, it's an it's a interesting example. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. So the question is, how important is it to have a consistent experience across browsers, and are you working with other browser vendors um, to make the UI consistent? Um, so to answer your, the piece of your second question, um, we try as hard as we can to sort of publish our research that we do in papers and to like talk about the UI work that we're going to do a long period of time before it actually rolls out, you know, so that um, other browser vendors, other applications, et cetera, can take advantage of this, um, you know, and ideally make things consistent. But ultimately, um, I think that if we all sort of agree on the general shape um, of where things are going, like for example, that there should be no positive security indicators and we should only show negative security indicators that really show a warning, it doesn't really matter what shape or form those actually do. Um, you know, I don't think that, you know, certainly some people use a lot of different browsers, a lot of different apps, but ultimately I don't think that people will say like, oh, Chrome was showing a green lock and like Edge was showing like a green shield, so I'm not sure which one of these they mean, right? Like, people are gonna be warned by a warning and otherwise they're not gonna be warned. So I'm, I, I don't think it's that important for the indicators to be exactly the same. Yes. 